There's great value in diversity in an organisation and I think look, being able to look beyond what's on a page in a CV is really important. Welcome to Breaking the Binary, brought to you by women and gender diverse people in tech, where your hosts are Arden Jarrett and Sarah Fraser. And today we have Beck Shepherd. So really excited to dive into that. But first off, I'd like to acknowledge you, Wabakul and Wara, my people, who are the traditional custodians of the land where we're recording today. Uh, we pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And we extend that respect to all First Nations Australians on who tra- whose traditional lands you're listening from today. So we'd like to thank our sponsors. Newy Tech People. Whoop, whoop. Uh, Port of Newcastle. Yay. And MGA Thermal. I've run out of nice sounds, but <laughs> also good. <laughs> so, Beck, first off, what are your pronouns? Um, she, her. Excellent. Uh, random fact about yourself? Random fact about myself. I I guess the, bit, the big thing that pops up is that I joined the military really, really young. So I left um, school and pretty much joined the military at 17 years of age and managed Ooh. to have my 18th and 21st birthday both um, deployed in Afghanistan. Holy. <laughs> okay. Right. How, yeah. Did you get to celebrate? <laughs> um, not really. No. Yeah. Yeah. So I should should say. So the 18th, I was at recruits, so I didn't get to drink. You weren't allowed to mm-hmm, drink then. Mm-hmm. And my 21st, and when you're in um, a deployed environment, there's no alcohol. So yeah. no, it was kind of just celebrations with all the people around me. Still, that's that is something <laughs> very different to my 18th and 21st, which involved a fair bit of alcohol and a lot of glitter for some reason. Oh, I made up for it, don't yeah. you worry. <laughs> yeah. Good, nice, yeah. great. <laughs> All right, another rapid-fire question. What's something you're proud of? Um, my kids. Oh. I think I have two awesome little humans and I think raising kids and maintaining a career is really, really hard Yeah. Um, and raising good humans is mm. hard and I'm not saying I do it perfectly. I definitely don't, but I'm super proud of them and, and who they are becoming. Oh. I can vouch. They're really good kids. Yeah, have met them. Yeah, they're cuties. <laughs> Kids kind of scare me, but I'm going to pack that away. <laughs> I'm sure they're great. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're going to meet them eventually, but obviously through work. But um, my daughter, I, I say she's like my, um, she's like a miniature me, mm. which I find hilarious, but also very frustrating at the same time. Mm. My mum calls her my karma. <laughs> <laughs> and she really is, isn't she? Like she's yeah. got, she has a personality to boot. And it's fun, <laughs> but Really annoying when you wanted to do something. So. Oh, the taste of my own medicine. That's Damn right. It. That's right. <laughs> so how do you relax or what do you do on your days off? Oh, I, I feel like I don't really – I'm a terrible person to ask this question because I don't really <laughs> do that. Um, I I am a, a single parent, so I do have time off where my children aren't – are they with their dad? So in those times, I guess I think what I do is I love listening to – um, books, so audiobooks. I'm not very good at reading. I hate it. I mm. can't sit still, but I can listen to audiobooks and I love podcasts. So um, I'm a closet nerd uh, and I like listening to lots of cyber podcasts. Oof. And what else do I do? CrossFit. I'm a CrossFit art. Yeah. No, it's not a cult, oh. <laughs> mm. but I do enjoy CrossFit. I feel yep. like if you have to clarify, it's not a cult. <laughs> Oh, it's probably good evidence that it might be. <laughs> it's like the standard go-to everyone says to me, oh, it's a cult, isn't it? <laughs> okay, I only go like once a week if that. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we accidentally select for a lot of people that say, oh, I don't relax. Like I know that was my answer. That's yeah. been a lot of people's answers. <laughs> I think it's it's definitely a theme that's coming through. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, people spend a lot of time working on their things that they enjoy. Yeah. I've started listening to a book called Raising Good Humans and one of the major sections in it that I've just finished is about um, mindfulness and I it certainly made me more aware of the fact that I don't relax and that I yeah. need to find ways to do that and be more mindful of the little things and appreciate the little things. I think they, daily grind gets you to a point where you stop appreciating those things. Yeah. So that's kind of my 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 next year goal is to be really mindful and to start slowing down as much as I can whilst also still being really fast because that's how I function. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. love it. So how would you explain your tech? Like does it have a short uh, word (laughs) for it? Yeah. So I didn't prep to any of your questions despite I'm like you, Sarah. You said you read something right beforehand. I I had all good intentions to prep for this but – 
when I was thinking about this specific question, I don't really feel like I'm in tech per se or one of the top six tech categories that you typically think of. So my my answer would be I'm, I'm a cyber worthiness specialist, which is a, um, a broader set of cybersecurity. And my primary tech would be military technology, which is operational technology. But we also deal with information technology across the different six areas. I love that you know that there are six areas because this is all news to me. <laughs> Usually we just get a word and we smash tech to the end of it and that's what we do. <laughs> Everything's tech. Yeah. Yeah. If you yeah. put tech on the end, that's good enough. It's yeah. tech now. <laughs> well, I was going to say like military weapon systems, but then I thought that would scare people. So oh, that's nice. <laughs> cool. Stayed away from yeah. that. I mean, <laughs> you probably, everyone would be like, oh, okay, that makes sense given that you were in the military at 17. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So I would ask how did you get into that? Um, but I think the answer is pretty much self-explanatory. But what mm. led you down this path of why did you join the military in the first place? Then why yeah. did you stay? And then how did you end up where you are now? Yeah, um, so I joined the military because I had no idea what I wanted to be. I put a lot of pressure on myself. I'm sure you, you can both relate to this. My, my, um, age or my, you know, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? My generation, mm. there was a lot of pressure on us to know exactly what we wanted to be. And a lot of the language that was used around that was what you chose when you left school was what you were for life. Yeah. And I'm not that person. I've never been that person. I'm self-diagnosed ADHD. I'm constantly thinking about the next thing that I'm going to be doing. And I get bored really quickly too. So leaving school, I just felt completely underprepared to make that decision, but I also didn't really want to travel and I wanted to make money. So, and that's the way it always been. I started my first job at 14 and the idea of traveling and not having money was really foreign to me. <laughs> so I went to, I had applied to uni. I was going to become a psychologist and thought, I just look, I'm not really sure that's for me. And in the end, I just on a whim applied for the military. And I think within about five months, I was at recruits and um, and doing that. Fast forward, I did 13 years full-time service. So I was a non-commissioned officer first, and then I commissioned um, and became an officer in the same category, which was in intelligence. And um, I was doing that job, absolutely loved it. I think one of the great things about the military is when you get bored, you do have options, you can change. And that was really attractive to me when I when I enlisted. But 2020, right before COVID hit, I had had my two children, I was starting to question my life and what it was that I wanted. And I was also bit, like noticing myself getting really frustrated with some of the small things. And I think I'd always told myself, um, I heard this one quote once that has stuck with me for life. And it's, it's kind of my mantra. It's, I always want to be interested and interesting. And at that point in my life in 2020, I realized that I, I really wasn't that anymore. And I didn't feel like I was adding the value to the organization that I could have been. And it wasn't, it wasn't doing anything for me. So fast forward like a few months from that point, And I just happened to have this wonderful opportunity just pop up that I didn't really even consider at first until I started to realize just what it would mean for the capabilities that I had been working with in the past. And yeah, I got offered a job to become a consultant in cyber, um, something I'd never done. I'd never touched cyber. Definitely didn't think I was in any way, shape or form qualified for it. But my now director just saw something in me and, and gave me the opportunity. And I think it took me four weeks and I was out of the military. Jeez. I like how you say it just popped up. What an accident. But at the same time, you'd done like so much prep work <laughs> to be ready to capitalize on that opportunity as well. Yeah, I don't know. I think there are like happy mistakes and, and happy um, like opportunities that pop up that you were never really expecting to be there. Yeah. For me, that's what it was. Yeah. I don't think I had, I didn't think I was going to do that. I hadn't worked towards that. I am not degree qualified. I am not your traditional tech person. I didn't come through university and I'm absolutely not a beeps and squeaks or a zeros and ones kind of person. But somehow I just managed to fall into that position where somebody trusted me to go and take what I'd learnt as an analyst and apply that into cyber worthiness. And yeah, I just got lucky, I guess. 
Beeps and squeaks is really fun. <laughs> yeah, beeps and squeaks. So in Intel, we have different categories of intelligence in the military, and one of them is in electronic warfare. And I am the kind of person, I'm very tactile. I am, you know, I have to see things to understand them, which is funny being in cyber because that's yeah. definitely not what you yeah. think. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But beeps and squeaks is how I describe electronic warfare. I could never quite understand waveforms or understand, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum. I hated it. I think I failed the test like three times. But, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, so what is your favourite part about what you do now? Well, now I'm the general manager of the company. So my favourite part has certainly changed over the last year or so, Um Previously, like if you'd have asked me when I was just a consultant, not just a consultant, <laughs> I love our consultants, they're fantastic, but I would have certainly focused on the thrill of being able to do something that contributes to Australia's security, like that's a real thrill and a rush. Mm -hmm. But now for me, it's actually watching the company grow and it's watching our team grow with such amazing humans and seeing them get that same thrill that I used to get. That That's what I like. Have you seen the space change a lot in the period of time that you've been within it? I think, I mean, very brief period of time. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's a, I am an anomaly, I think, to go from being a consultant to a general manager in such a short time frame. I think it's certainly changing in lots of different ways. People's appreciation of the need for cybersecurity is certainly improving. I think we've got a long way to go and the government certainly has a lot of work to do to make sure that Australia is picking up its game and becoming more resilient um, in the threat landscape. But I also think it's a massive shift in the way that we're seeing these new people coming from all these different walks of life and coming into the workforce. That's definitely changed in, in the last two years, particularly over COVID. Yeah. <laughs> If you don't mind commenting on it, how did you find being a young woman and then progressing your career through the military? If you want to comment yeah. on it, I totally get it if you don't want to. Massive breath in. Um, let me choose my words carefully. Um, somebody once asked me if I would support my daughter joining the military and I think that's a good way to look at it. Um, I think by the time she's old enough to be in the military, I'm hoping that they'll be in a po at a point where a lot of the challenges that I faced will no longer be challenges, but I'm also realistic. And change takes a really, really long time. My early years in the military, I just conformed. And some of the things that I shouldn't have accepted, I did accept. And I know the military is working very, very hard to to um, remove some of those behaviours and improve their values to incorporate things that are important to having women and gender diverse um, employees. I think I've also experienced a lot of issues and challenges during that career tied to being a mother. And that's something that a lot of us don't really appreciate. I think there's a lot of pressure on women and mainly that's internally driven now because of the way we're raised to be able to do everything and to be able to maintain the status quo in your career whilst also having a baby. And it's it's kind of like it's one or another. It's go and have a baby and that's it. Be a mother. Or don't have children and have a career. And I think that was a massive challenge for me. I struggled a lot with it coming back from maternity leave with my second child, my daughter. I really felt a lot of... Um, not guilt. I did. I did feel guilt for them. I felt guilt that I was leaving them home or at daycare. Mm. But I also felt like a bit of an imposter at work because reintegrating is hard. Mm -hmm. So I think they're the two massive challenges of being a female in the military. And I don't see them changing at a rapid pace, but I do see them changing slowly. Mm. It's also difficult, I'd imagine, for um, if there are, say, men who want to stay at home with their kids as well. Like that's not even an option for a lot of people, I'd imagine, if they wanted to be the primary caregiver or be more involved at home. Yeah, I think it's interesting. So the military have changed their policy a lot and like, like 
I'm not really in a position to be able to talk a lot about the military because that's one of our things. So, you know, you don't talk. It's like Fight Club. (laughs) When you're in Fight Club, you don't talk about Fight Club. Or it's like Vegas when you're in Vegas. Everything stays in Vegas. But I think um, it's really positive to see that they've got changing policies around ensuring some um, equal opportunity for men when they're having families. Like their policy on parental leave is far better than what it was when I had children. I have children when I had my little children. (laughs) Um, But I think it's actually the stigma attached to that that's still an issue. Mm. I don't think that enough women will take up that opportunity um, because there's so much stigma attached to that. And also, how do you do it? Because you're emotional, you've got this beautiful little human that you want to raise and you want to be with, and you've got all of these societal norms and beliefs around you influencing you and then you've got a spouse who has the same thing like how how do you balance that so yeah yeah how do you make it more normal I know I had a stay-at-home dad and he used to cop a lot of stuff from a lot of the women that he went to like PNC with and tried to participate in parent groups because he was a parent he was a primary caregiver and they did not want him in the space which I thought was always really fascinating yeah (laughs) as a choice um, well, hats so, off to your dad for yeah. doing that. Just be nice people, everyone. That's a take-home oh, no. message. Be kind. <laughs> don't be a – I don't know what word I'm allowed to say here, but a poo emoji. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think practising no judgement. Like, yeah. We're just so bad at it. Yeah. So we only it. see such a small amount of each other's lives. That's like, right. We don't know why someone's making a decision. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think that that's been – probably the primary challenge of that the, your career so far? Yeah, I, I certainly think so. I think that combined with my internal or my inner monologue. Yeah. Um, I don't think I, I'm yet to meet a female that doesn't in some way feel like she has to put herself down or demean the amount of work and, and value she brings to an organisation because of her inner monologue Yeah, and because of how she believes she has to be. Mm. Um, that has made it hard for me yeah. and I think challenges really and now will always be people. People are hard, mm-hmm. really hard, and that's, you know, your customers, your employees, but yourself. Yeah. There's just too many variables. It's not a perfect science. Soft skills are hard. Mm. So, yeah, that's probably extending on <laughs> the challenges there. And it is such a weird balance. I know I was reading How to Win Friends and Influence People, which is still a good book, everyone. <laughs> Give it a read. And they said, you know, you should speak in in softer tones and, and leave room for error so people feel more comfortable with you. And reading that felt so weird as a woman because that's the advice that they say don't do that. Like you've got to sound sure yeah. of yourself or they won't take you seriously. So you're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. Like you're either too assertive and they think you're horrible or you're not insertive enough and they don't think that you know what you're talking about. And it's like, yeah. oh, well, I'll just live in the Goldilocks zone and that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think my three are you've got to be humble. Yeah. You've got to be credible and you've got to be approachable. All of the tone stuff like, you know, I am quite a direct human. That's mm. as a result of the military. Like, oh, didn't you know what I'm like? <laughs> I'm very poor at filtering things and I'm certainly working on my reactivity. Um, but, yeah, that the tone thing has always got me and mm. I think that's often led to some pretty interesting comments about me and perceptions of me that, as you said, they're only seeing a very small snippet in time, mm. but it's funny what tone can do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really funny. And it's often like they cherry pick this to discredit what you've been doing, which I think is a really fun thing. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, well, we can't do the blatantly biased thing, so we're just going to pick out this bit instead, which is a criticism we'd probably never give to a man in the space, but here you go. Is yeah. a gift for you. <laughs> yeah. I think you were mentioning earlier it's the, you know, actually it was you, Arden, you were talking about how people weren't engaging directly with you or, you know, it still happens all the time, right? And it's not 
one person's fault in particular. It's yes. it's everything around us. Mm. It's the way we're raised. It's the, the social norms. And like I said, that's cultural change is going to take a long, long time to achieve. But you certainly have experiences where you will walk into a room and you will be treated differently purely because of your gender. And that is frustrating, but I think one of the things I've always said to myself in those situations is, you know, internally be calm and handle this professionally, but also you don't know what's going on with the other person. You don't know how they've been raised. You don't know if they're even aware of what they're doing. So it's about being understanding and respectful at the same time of the situation and and the the people in the room particularly. Yep. Assume positive intent. It's a little thing I like to tell myself over and over again. (laughs) Hard to do. Hard to do. You're making this hard, but I'm going to assume you mean well. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think sometimes you can also see it as um, a little bit of a puzzle. Like I got the phone call. It's not um, to do with gender at all, but I got off a phone call with someone who was um, a little bit frustrating frustrated that we weren't taking an opportunity but I can see where they were coming from but I had to lead them to see where we were coming from to understand why we weren't Mm -hmm. and then it just fell into place and they were completely understanding but it was just really like yeah it's it's interesting to see I view these things as like a how can I solve this inverted commas problem Mm -hmm. um as opposed to like why aren't they understanding? Mm. Mm. And, like, I guess the the stakes are pretty low in that situation. <laughs> so, yeah, and same with sales. Like, I can go into a different sales call and feel like that didn't land too well and then go to the next one and go, oh, well, I can position it this way and it lands better. Yeah. yeah. It's got to meet mm. people where they are. See, people are hard. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to manage people, thankfully. I think that's a <laughs> conscious decision my business has made. <laughs> Thanks, James and Linda. <laughs> or you're just reminding me of like every time I sit down in my in my office or in our office in Hunter Street, I swear I walk in the room and I'm like, am I way too informal with you guys? Like I feel like we're throwing out constantly and this is not good. This is not good. Anyway. I like um, the element of a manager where you're human because it allows through demonstration for any of your direct reports to be human, you yeah. know, because if you – can say I'm having a less than ideal mental health day, then they feel like they can then say the same thing. It's some of that lead by example. Mm. Yeah. But, I mean, at the same time, like 100% Mm. agree with you and I think it's important to be human as a manager and as a leader. Like, you know, obviously in the military, leadership is a massive thing that we're – we're grown to be from the start you join – or from the moment you join, there you go, there's my terrible English. But <laughs> I think people can also take advantage of that. Yeah. yeah. And that's a hard place to be in. Mm. It's it's showing you vulnerabilities. Mm. And particularly as a woman, when you show your vulnerabilities, that can really have the opposite effect of that positive experience that you're talking about. It mm. can be your Achilles heel that somebody then takes advantage of or it could be the thing that starts a, a complete um, – you know, issue with an employee who just no longer sees you as being somebody who's authoritative and that's problematic in itself. How have you found that balance then? I haven't. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, I haven't. Um, I will never claim to be perfect at it at Mm. all. I 100% am still constantly learning that. Uh, You know, I think as a leader, so commissioned in 2013, so what we're coming up on 10 years in just a pure leadership role, I've had so many different experiences that have aligned with either of those two cases that I've just tried to learn from each and every single one of them, but I'm still not good Mm. at it. It would be really hard to still be vulnerable after like so many um, experiences like that. Yeah, that's right. And I, you know, you do have, without sounding like a jerk, but not in this job, I've been really lucky with the people we've got in our company, but in my past job, you do have people that just are not nice people. Mm. Yep. And they just don't, they're just so internally focused and so 
driven by their own needs that they don't necessarily think about the other person in the equation and that's, again, why people are hard. Mm. And those people, they make it really hard for you to move on from that. So that's, you know, I talked about mindfulness and I really want to be more um, aware of who I am and how I react and how I behave and how I see and view um, situations from both sides. And that's just more along the lines of that, just making sure I'm being more conscious of how other people might be feeling in those situations and and what the factors are that contribute to it. Yeah. Does, Mm. well, how do you uh, find leading very technical teams as well? I love the nerds. (laughs) (laughs) They are awesome. (laughs) Yes. Um, (laughs) I used to think it was hard. I think now I'm finding it easier Mm. because at the core of it, they're still a human yep. and they were still raised by humans who are 99% of the time not technical nerds, <laughs> yeah, you know? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like you were. <laughs> You've got one art. I certainly have. You've got the, the nice blend. There's a lot of technical nerds in, in the extended family. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but still, like, at the core of you, you've still got the soft and squishy mm. component. And I think when you you look at a human who is really technical and really, really smart in an area that I feel 100% incompetent in, at the basis of it, they're still a human. And so leading them is actually not as hard as, as you would think. Yep. Mm-hmm. Is it easier to find better, uh, I guess, values fit people in an organisation now that you are a general manager? And I imagine you have a lot bigger sway of the kinds of people that you hire as well? At the moment, I do all recruiting. Oh, nice. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, we are, we're only 28. So um, when I say only, I mean, Josh and Silla have done an amazing thing. They grew the company. We were three when I started in yep. 2020. Um, but I think because I do the recruiting and Josh is always involved in that as well, we're really picky about yep. who we bring on. And one of the things we do is it's not necessarily about their experience or their technical um, proficiency or their hard skills. We look at their soft skills and yep. they have to align with what we value and where we see the company being in 10 years' time relies on that being a good match. We don't 100% get it right every single time, mm. but because we do that recruiting, we can be very specific about it. Yeah, and that's such a valuable thing, especially for a technical company and is something that's often overlooked. It's like how many years of Java development do you have? Five, yeah. great, you're in. Mm, yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, you're a bit of a poo emoji. <laughs> <laughs> we need a button for you. Like, no. <laughs> I did hear that um, I got bleeped in the previous episode. I don't know oh. what you're talking about, Sarah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it straight. No. It's just that when I'm <laughs> uploading the podcast, I have to rate if it's clean or not. No, oh, so yeah. I'm like, well, I You're welcome, Spotify. <laughs> I've cleaned up my act. You have no idea how nervous I was about swearing. <laughs> and when you spend so long in the military, it's natural to yeah. swear. Like every second word was a swear word when I was younger. So my mother, please don't listen to this. <laughs> but, but I swear I'm still good. <laughs> but seriously, I was like, oh, they're going to be bleeping me the entire way through. But That's all right. I've, I've done well. It, yeah. yeah, you're doing great. I've been a victim of the bleep. <laughs> <laughs> I should have put some fun noise over the top anyway. I got a clown horn. <laughs> okay, you can use that snippet next time. <laughs> so can you share a bit more about like the company and the company values and, and what you're doing now, where it's going? Yeah, of course. Um, this stuff makes me really nervous if because I know it. Josh is going to listen to this <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> um, so the company, uh, our company is called Alpha Echo. Um, we started actually quite a few years ago now. Josh started as what I call a lone ranger. He'll love that. Um, he was a consultant working with defence and he just happened to have a knack for cyber worthiness. Mm. So cyber worthiness is um, actually a bit more than cyber security. It's more focusing 
focusing on, yeah, specific elements of cybersecurity, but focusing on resilience of systems and survivability, which is really important when you talk about military systems. I don't know about you, but if we ever go to war, you don't really want your uh, platforms to just stop functioning, (laughs) right? (laughs) Really important, but I think it's a bit more pragmatic than traditional cybersecurity. So, Instead of just being all about compliance, it's about understanding risk and managing risk based on the threat environment. And, um, you know, our platform specifically, they move. Things change. Technology develops so quickly that it's impossible for you to constantly be compliant. So subworthiness kind of shifts it and makes it more about understanding that changing environment. That's that's what our company does. We primarily were focused on the defence sector, so um, military platforms, as I mentioned in tech earlier on. We are now slowly moving into commercial, um, co- like corporate clients. Like, look, you'll laugh at this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so... I'm so military that I told you I was in my military uniform earlier this morning Mm. and I had to change, which is why I'm in PT gear. But I am so military that I'm like, this is my uniform and you're in civvies (laughs) and you work for a civvy company. (laughs) So Civvies. (laughs) Civvies. Yeah. So I think that the team often laugh at me because I'm like, oh, you're in civvies today. And I'm literally talking about the fact that they're wearing chucks and like ripped up jeans. I'm like, you're in civvies. (laughs) Normal people clothes. (laughs) Normal (laughs) people clothes. Civilians. Yeah. You're civilians. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny because I've been a civilian for like three years and I'm still like, you're a civilian. <laughs> You're not at all a pleb, but you are a civilian. <laughs> yes. We're halfway there. <laughs> so bad when you catch yourself thinking that. <laughs> don't say it, don't say it. Um, yeah, so I, I say civvy companies, but I'm talking about corporate clients. So we're slowly moving into that space, um, working with some schools and starting to work with a few more companies um, and businesses around Newcastle. And that's all about taking those principles that we have learned through securing military weapon systems and tying that into organisations. And that's multidisciplinary. So instead of just focusing on locking down a computer, we're actually focusing on the entire organisation and how you do business and what is actually valuable for you versus locking down the computer when your employees are just going to break it anyway because you've locked it down too much. As someone who had a school computer, I'm very aware how quickly we broke them. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And you know what? Students are really crafty. Yeah. Really crafty. And I think the things that you can do now with like a $20 piece of kit off of Amazon, like a Raspberry Pi and just plug it into something and they can make some pretty interesting modifications to what you think are secure systems. We just want to play games at school. That's all we want. Yeah. Let me stick a (laughs) Minecraft, like (laughs) Minecraft in here somewhere and that's good. But yeah, that's, you know, we're moving into that space. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Uh, The majority of our people up until about two years ago were veterans. So we we, um, have a significant veteran workforce. We are proudly over 25% women, which is the standard for tech, proudly, and um, have just brought on our first um, human resources person Mm. to start improving that. What do you think has contributed to being over the average as it is? It's like far over the average. I pulled the stats for Newcastle the other day and the stats for cybersecurity in particular was like 12% women. Yeah. Really? It was yeah, really bad. Sad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's our um, – it's actually the way in which we recruit. Hmm. So, look, we pay well. Yep. That, <laughs> that always helps. helps. That helps. And we have a really great culture, even if I do say so myself. <laughs> um, so that helps retain. Yeah. But when it comes to having those women come into the company, I, f- I feel like we create a safe space, but we also create an environment where they can learn. Hmm. And that's really important. I think in consulting and in cyber, um, other cyber companies, it's all about what you bring with you. Whereas I'm like, what are the soft skills you bring? And what can we teach you? Mm -hmm. And what are those hard skills that you bring that I can then translate into something that's applicable? And because we are that multidisciplinary focus where we have, you know, Riley probably talks to you about it a lot. Like he's getting so many plugs in this. Oh, my partner podcast. works for this company. <laughs> um, don't give him a raise because I don't want him to earn more than me. <laughs> I feel like you might need to explain that further down the line too. <laughs> Whoever earns less has to stay at home with the ch- kid children if we have them, and it's not going to be me. <laughs> now it's all making sense, Riley. We're going to chat when I'm back in the office. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Now I, now I understand bonuses. Yeah. And all the fun that he's like, please no. Gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> it might end up being the thing that both of you want to do. But, yeah. You know. Maybe. Mm. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> You never know until you're there. And yeah. even then, it might change when you're there. That's yeah. true. Which is totally fine. We'll Uno reverse it. I'll say I'll do it and then I'll have the kids and I'll be like, actually, no. Too much vomit. That <laughs> yeah. freaks me out. Yeah, well, let's do 50-50. <laughs> I'm down for that. No. Sorry, I digress. No, that's <laughs> fine. No, it's fine. Yeah, I think that the fact that we are focused on the different elements of cyber where we have people like, you know, let me explain. In our mm. 28 people, we have engineers who were literally elect- electiars in the military. We have um, systems engineers. We have Riley, who's our <laughs> cognitive <laughs> behaviours <laughs> specialist, <laughs> you know, and he's our first one, but he probably feels a little out there on his own. But mm. somebody with a psychology background who understands humans and mm. suddenly when you start thinking about the way I describe cyberworthiness before you start to understand why that's important, and some of the work they're doing, but we have teachers. We have lots of intelligence professionals and in the military, intelligence professionals don't realise their value because they're not told their value and we we bring them in and we teach them about cyber. And so that's, we've got a lot of women through that program. Um, We have, what else do we have? Lots of things, lawyers. We have human resources people. We have people literally who came from business administration and we just taught them about cyber. It seems like you see the diversity in a range of backgrounds being like educations and and different areas of specialty. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I think there's great value and diversity in an organisation and I think look, being able to look beyond what's on a page in a CV is really important. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I definitely think that's contributed to our success um, for gaining and retaining awesome humans because that's who we have working hmm. for us. So we, Josh and I talk about it as our pinch ourselves moments. I think I don't <laughs> have a week where I don't have a pinch myself moment of – how do we get here and why does this person work for us? Because they rock. Mm. Like we have that every week and probably look stupid because, you, you know, you get emotional thinking about that because it's a pinch myself moment. Like mm. right now I'm feeling that. I'm recognising that we've had, we've got such a great opportunity but we've also got such great humans mm. because of that. Do you mm. think you have now like what I like to refer to as a critical mass like, it's really hard to be the first woman in an organisation and it's slightly easier to be the second woman and then it's even easier than that to be the third woman or man, if it's a woman-dominated organisation, whatever it is. Um, be, the like, one of the many people that look similar to you. Now mm-hmm. that you've got so many women, it seems like an easier option for other women to join because they're not going to have to be the first or the second. The environment's already set up for them. I definitely think when people are looking at the company, that's something that is contributing to a decision. Like we have a really awesome female joining us and that's something you'll find out about another time. Um, (laughs) A really awesome human joining us in in about a month's time and I think that probably contributed. Um, But actually the retaining them once they're there is more important to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I have to give a hats off to our guys. Like the way in which our gentlemen treat the females in our workforce is, you know, amazing. I can't, I can't even describe it. And I think that's a combination of, again, just having great humans. But there's a lot of ex-military. There's a lot of um, professionals who have, you know, one of our guys who is an ex-military He is just the kindest, nicest human ever, but he's also got a a partner and a daughter and I know they rule the roost and that's, (laughs) you know, as a result of that, I know he is treating the other women in our organisation in a way that is respectful and allows them to feel like they're seen as equal. Yep. Um, and that they're always treated well. I'm sure your amazing leadership plays a part too because (laughs) when you see women in leadership, like it it shows that, you're not just there as the bottom layer of the organisation, you know. Yeah. I think it makes a really big difference. Yeah, I agree. I think um, if you're able to be in a position as an executive in a company where you are still able to interact with the organisation, that's mm. awesome and that does contribute. I think when you get into a larger organisation, like I think of um, Cheryl Sandberg, for example, who was um, Facebook. 
she was really inspirational to a lot of women who got into technology. She still is very, mm. very inspirational. But I think there's a limit to which that reaches inside that specific organisation. I think because we're small enough then, yeah, yeah. definitely agree. Yeah. Mm. So what are you most excited about in the upcoming year? Is it continuing to grow, diversify, just generally kick butt? Is butt okay? Yes. You'll find out when there's a noise over. (laughs) It'll either be bleeped or it won't. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Um, What am I most excited about? Personally or professionally? Uh, Let's get both. Okay. (laughs) All of the options. I'll I'll take all of them. Thank you. (laughs) Okay. Um, Well, let's go with professionally first because we've just spoken about the company. We have a lot of really exciting projects happening right now. I think – you know, we've got two things that we're actively working on and hoping to finish off in the next few months that will be the first of their type in in Australia and actually one of those may be the first in the world. That's pretty exciting. And um, you're smiling because I know you know what I'm talking I about. I have no idea what you're yeah. talking about. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm really excited about that. I think like, again, I just love seeing our incredible employees come up with awesome things that are going to change this landscape Mm. but you know I said to you you know background military we we say we bleed blue (laughs) as in we'll never leave the military it's always in your heart and one of the biggest things when you're in the military is you're there for the sake of the safety of the nation and that doesn't stop that doesn't go away so all of these projects it's just like to me it's about keeping Australia safe secure it's about our future generations so that to me is something I'm really really excited about professionally personally look it's I won't lie it has been a very challenging 12 months for me personally um, with a lot of stuff at home so I have decided that the end of this year that I am not allowed to wallow or be sad about those things anymore. I'm going to learn from them and move on. And I booked myself and two of my girlfriends. We are going to New York Ooh. for New Year's Eve. Oh, oh, wow. Yep, to watch the ball drop <laughs> in the most exclusive party that they have over there. So wow. I am very excited. That's very fancy. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to be like, well, bye. Cause see you year. later this year. <laughs> yeah, like I love all these parts, but yeah. all of this is gone. Like, see you in yeah. heck. Yes, the that's trash. right. There's no beep word on that one. <laughs> 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 Done it. <laughs> so why have you chosen to stay in Newcastle? I'm assuming with the military you moved around a lot? I don't know. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Did <yeah>. you? <laughs> um, well, look, you... I'm not going to give you my 34 years of my life because it could be quite boring, but (laughs) my dad was a policeman, so I moved a lot as Mm. a kid. I think I um, moved every two years at least, which meant I was going to constantly moving to different schools, which is great when you consider yourself to be an introvert and you have Mm. to try and make new friends. Mm. Um, And the military certainly teaches you. We we call it um, an extroverted introvert. You learn to function in those environments. In the military, I did move, but I was really lucky that I managed to jump between jobs and stay in Newcastle. They called me the Newcastle Air Force. (laughs) (laughs) But um, actually, it was just the kids. I stayed here. I love Newcastle. Uh, Well, look, if this weather continues, I'm moving. (laughs) (laughs) It's too cold. (laughs) No, the rain. I can't. (laughs) Have you seen Twilight? Ah, uh, yes, the cultural yeah. phenomenon. Oh, my God. I don't know. I don't – like, I was right on the cusp. Who has it? <laughs> yeah, I'm a once or older. twice, gee. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> but, you know, the town forks, mm. how it's like the vampires live there because it's yeah. constantly raining. That's so Newcastle, right? Like, <laughs> I feel like I should have glittery skin and just never see the sunlight. <laughs> Might have been a dream of 15-year-old yeah. me. So. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I look at myself and I'm like, this I basically would have – glittery skin with how pale I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> when do I see the sun? <laughs> Not in Newcastle. Yeah. Not in Newcastle. So yeah, it's a combination of things. It's I wanted to give my kids stability. Mm-hmm. My my son has some, you know, similar challenges as what I do. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to give him that stability. And um, I'm, we're a co-parenting family. So stability is really important when kids are moving between homes. Um, but also, yeah, I just... I do have a thing for Newcastle. 
We also have things for Newcastle. Yeah. But I mean, this isn't a Newcastle podcast, right? So (laughs) So we've we've gone global, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. So what advice would you give your younger self? Just, do you know what? I would give myself the advice to stop being so hard on myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure everyone says that to you, but it's just to be kind to myself Mm. because I never mastered that and I still haven't mastered that. Again, the inner monologue comes out a lot and, you know, all those nasty things people say about you, I can guarantee you I've said worse things to myself in my head and that's the sad part for most females is we are so mean to ourselves. Mm. So if I could go back, I would say, you know, just be kind. Mm. Be kind to yourself through everything that happens. Take the flip on, I always got taught as a kid, treat other people how you want to be treated. And now I'm learning to treat myself how I treat other people. Yes. Because yes. I'm really nice to other people. And then I do something yes. wrong and I'm like, stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we do. We punish ourselves so mm. much. I think so that much. there's also a, like a fear that you think other people will then treat you how you're thinking those thoughts to yourself. Mm-hmm. And so then that's one of the reasons why you're like, oh, that was a really stupid thing to do because people will notice. But most of the time, you know, they won't. Like, yeah, that sort of thing where you're overly critical of yeah. everything. Yeah, People are usually pretty self-absorbed. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I tried to learn. Like as a te- teenager, you're like, everyone's looking at me. No, everyone else is panicking about the fact that everyone's looking at them. Yeah. Nobody's looking at each other. <laughs> yeah. It's like when you get the giant zit on your face and mm. you're like, this is so embarrassing. Yeah. And like, like, I'm 34 and I still get pimples and it oh. drives me insane <laughs> and I hate it. And it's like, it's the same thing. It's, I'm so mean and I'm saying, mm. oh, everyone's going to think I'm so ugly and I'm supposed to look a certain way and be a certain way because I, I am a figurehead or I, well, not a figurehead, but I am an executive and people mm. see you and... Even just stuff like, I don't want my kids to see me like that, but now I've got a little girl and I've got a little boy. And I'm like, I equally want them to understand that those things are unimportant yeah, and that they need to be kind to themselves. Mm. So, yeah, if I could go back, I'd say that to me too. Mm. It's amazing. It's mm. very solid advice. What would you say to people who are looking to enter the field that you're in? Yeah. I think it's just just give it a go. Just Mm. go and find a company that aligns with you and your values and beliefs. And if they're the right fit, they will see the value in the skills that you bring. I'm not saying go out and ask for $300,000 a year if you're unqualified (laughs) because that's not going to work. (laughs) No, but go and find that company and be honest, be open, be pragmatic and recognize that, you know, even if you're a student, if you're a student and you're entering this field, think outside the box. Mm. A Bachelor of IT is not necessarily the thing that you need to get into cybersecurity. Sometimes there are other areas that you can go down that you really love that are going to be better for you because you are passionate about it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in the long run, you're probably going to get there a lot quicker. But then there's the mature age um, employees as well, or students in some cases, don't undervalue what you already bring to the table because I did that. I didn't see the value in what I had and somebody else did. And if I wasn't fortunate enough to have that person see that, I wouldn't be here now. Those transferable skills that you think, oh, I didn't do exactly what this says on the box or all my other experience matters. Yeah. Not. Yeah. But Be humble, mm. credible, approachable, always. Yeah. Love it. Some good key messages there. I was trying to think of the, like, first letters of them, but my dyslexia brain was like, ah. <laughs> H-C-A. H-C-A. <laughs> I, I got as Initials far as H- to live by. And then my brain just went, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you. I was very nervous. <laughs> I feel weird being filmed and I definitely put on my best outfit for you. So. <laughs> it's just important that you're comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, give us a review if you like the podcast. Um, probably don't if you didn't like it. <laughs> Maybe send us some direct feedback. On LinkedIn. I actually had yeah. someone send me a LinkedIn message after one of the podcasts. Amazing. Really? Yeah. And now he's editing this episode so shout out to will um our new best friend slash editor (laughs) we appreciate you and please don't heckle me i work in a cyber company (laughs) 
<laughs> no heckling. Positive review. It's a delightfully <laughs> vague threat. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, um, you know, join us at a meetup. See us next time in your ears. Oh, we have um, an Instagram now. Oh, we have. Yeah, we do. Yeah. We've been mentioning Instagram this whole time without actually having an account. Now it exists. Now we do have an Instagram. So give it a follow. Um, it will be linked in the description of this episode. What's the ad tag? Uh, everyone belongs in tech with underscores. Nice. Beautiful stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I never know how to finish this. Goodbye. <laughs>